Uh, in contrast to the classes, what I have taken is going to be a little um, different. It's not going to be some kind of a basics that will be exam oriented. No, it is a kind of a. It's going to be a little different. So it was um, an oration, where, like Minakshi has said. Thanks, Minakshi, for uh, making me to repeat what I spoke on that occasion. It was in name of uh, one uh, famous ophthalmologist, uh, Dr. P. Shivaradi from Hyderabad, and whose name this oration was started by the State Ophthalmic Society. And uh, this, uh, when they asked me to choose a topic, I chose a topic called pseudo exfoliation, its prevalence, natural history, and treatment options. For the simple reason, because uh, the Telangana area, in, in that matter, in the southern, the southern part of India, has a significant uh, prevalence of uh, pseudo exfoliation. And the related problems we do see commonly in our clinics. So, what is pseudo exfoliation? Pseudo-exfoliation is nothing but a generalized disorder of the extracellular matrix. And it, one of the organs that it affects is, happens to be the eye. So what happens in pseudo-exfoliation? Basically, it produces abnormal basement membrane-like material, which gets deposited in different parts of the body that includes the eye. And it also affects the blood vessels and kidneys, lungs, heart, and in view of the meninges, and in view of that, they can have significant systemic associations when an individual has pseudo exfoliation. And if you look at the literature worldwide, and pseudo exfoliation accounts for 20 to 25 percent of open angle glaucoma. And if you see, we we did say that it is uh, it is a generalized disorder of the extracellular matrix. That's a very simplistic way of explaining pseudo exfoliation. And, but if you look at the exact pathophysiology, it's quite complex. We know part of it. We, are, we also don't know majority of it. And there are environ environmental factors that makes individual prone for the disease. There are also a lot of genetic factors, like uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism was isolated, that is called the LOX L1 gene, and it basically uh, catalyzes the elastin formation. And when there is abnormality associated with a LOX L1, the, the extracellular matrix becomes abnormal. And this inform important information came out when the entire Iceland population, they could take the genome genetic material from each individual, and they looked at the whole genome and evaluated. This was the important information they, that came out, because we all know Iceland has the maximum prevalence of pseudo-exfoliation. And also, the uh, Singapore group has uh, incriminated another polymorphism called the CACNA 1A. Other than the genetic, there are other factors that are associated with the pseudo-exfoliation, like oxidative stress, hypoxia, and some of the cytokinins and abnormal homocysteine have been incriminated in pathophysiology of pseudo-exfoliation. In other words, it's a very complex disorder that has both environmental, genetic, and inherent factors responsible for this. If you look at pseudo-exfoliation per se in India, we do have fairly good amount of information available from the population-based studies. The majority are from the southern India. We have one in the eastern part, one in the central part of the India. And uh, we also looked at who are the individuals who are likely to develop pseudo-exfoliation. We also looked at what happens to people with the pseudo-exfoliation after some time. That information we could gather mainly from the uh, population-based uh, studies where we could do the incident study. That means after we have finished the cross-sectional population-based st uh, study, after a period, we went back and re-examined those individuals to get this important information. And also the one in the Hyderabad is still going on, and it is much longer, almost 17 years later, they looked at their initial population. 
So information that's going to come out of this study is definitely going to be very valuable. If you look at the pseudo-exfoliation prevalence, the prevalence varies widely. It is almost 3 to 6 percent from the, based upon the population-based studies. And if you see carefully here, and it is uh, uh, the 3 percent from the Hyderabad study, which, is, which has a big component of urban population. The rural population ones has very high pseudo-exfoliation prevalence, that is from Madurai and also rural arm of our Chennai glaucoma study. And when, if you more critically look at it, urban cohort had significantly lower prevalence than the rural. That's almost, the rural is double that of the urban prevalence. And when we looked at the ocular risk factors for glaucoma based upon the prevalence studies from India, we, these are the important risk factors that came across. One is PACS, that is a predisposing factor for angle closure glaucoma. And the second most common is the pseudo-exfoliation. Pseudo-exfoliation seems to be a significant risk factor for uh, glaucoma in India. So you, when you look at globally, so where does the pseudo-exfoliation stand? I did talk about uh, early manifest glaucoma trial sometime in one of my lectures, uh, like when we talked about the risk factors, and they found that what are the risk factors that makes individual to progress faster in terms of open angle glaucoma? They found that thinner CCT is significant one, other than the older age, higher IOP. They also found that pseudo eyes with the pseudo exfoliation are at a very high risk for the. No, no, I am sorry. High risk for the progression of the disease. So that, that indicates the eyes with the pseudo exfoliation are likely to behave differently with the, from the eyes with the open angle glaucoma. Um, when you look at the pseudo exfoliation as a risk factor POEG, we did talk about it in, in EMGT. So we did talk about it some time back, what happens ocular hypertension with the pseudo exfoliation. Will the ocular hypertension with the pseudo exfoliation, do they behave the same way as the ocular hypertension without the pseudo exfoliation? So if you see carefully, the, the, the risk is much higher with the pseudo exfoliation. It is almost 10 times in the ocular hypertension treatment study. And we did talk about it, environmental factors are important for pseudo exfoliation. Because of that, you do see the distribution of the disease confined to certain populations and certain reasons. So when we looked at the incidence of pseudo exfoliation, that means people without pseudo exfoliation at baseline, after six years, if you see, it is a one versus the three. So the, in urban population, it is almost one person, whereas in the rural population, it is three percent. In our population, we also see associated narrow angles. I will talk about it during part of my lecture, why they develop narrow angles with the pseudo exfoliation. We also found, like in the old study, the significant people of them were having the ocular hypertension. And uh, as I mentioned, age is a risk factor for the pseudo exfoliation. The incidence of the disease increases with the age. And again, between the rural and urban, the rural population has significantly higher incidence of pseudo exfoliation. Interestingly, we also found there is a close association between the body mass index and the central cardinal thickness. People with the pseudo exfoliation, if you see carefully, that is um, uh, thinner carnal thickness and underweight, underweight, underweight was significantly associated with the pseudo exfoliation in contrast to the thicker carnal thickness and overweight are the normal weight. Most of the times, whoever is working in JCVC, if you can recollect how a patient with a pseudo exfoliation will look, most of the time, patient will be very thin, malnourished, sunken eyes. So it's very common feature what you see with the pseudo exfoliation. 
So we, in the similar way, we also found a lower BMI and also thinner central corneal thickness. It has little amount of significance when, when we talk about the management, which I will be covering in the later part of the lecture. And uh, as I mentioned, in the associations we found for the incidence was older age, rural resi uh, residency, illiteracy. The link we could attribute it was that people, illiterate people are likely to be manual laborers. Manual laborers are likely to be outside, and the environmental factor may be affecting their disease. Same way, nuclear cataract and pseudophagia. People with pseudoexfoliation will be higher risk for the cataract for the, some of the anoxic changes that happens with the pseudoexfoliation will make the eye susceptible for nuclear sclerosis. That's why you see more cataract surgeries in people with pseudoexfoliation. At the same time, you will see nuclear cataracts. So these are the associations we found that were significant for the incident pseudoexfoliation in our population. Interestingly, we, when we looked at what happened to the people with the pseudoexfoliation without glaucoma at the baseline, when we re-examined after six years, what happened? Almost 11 unilateral pseudoexfoliation converted to bilateral cases. The conversion is around 15%. 6% developed glaucoma. All of them had ocular hypertension at the baseline. Again, that suggests that in six years, people with the pseudo ocular hypertension with the uh, pseudoexfoliation are at a high risk to develop glaucoma. And incidence of cataract surgery was much higher in people with pseudoexfoliation group than without the pseudoexfoliation group. The other important factor we found was mortality uh, rates. If you look at the literature, there is no concrete evidence to say people with the pseudoexfoliation have higher mortality rates. So because it is, the evidence is not very clear, most of the time it is a hypothetical situation. But in our study, we found the mortality rates were significantly higher in those with the pseudoexfoliation at baseline. It is almost 23.8, that's 24%, than the rest of the study, which was 7%. Again, the difference was higher in the rural, if you look at the rural versus the urban. Even after adjusting for the gender and the age, sometimes it can be, the gender and age can be confounded for your finding. Even with that, we found the people with the pseudoexfoliation, the mortality rate is significantly higher, almost the double than the without the pseudoexfoliation. That tells us these people are at a higher risk for earlier deaths than the other group. Okay, that is about the epidemiology part of it. When you come to the clinical part of it, what are the clinical signs that are impo important in terms of pseudoexfoliation? Most of the times it is unilateral to start with. We don't know the reason why one eye it gets deposited, why the other eye doesn't get deposited. Interestingly, if you see pseudoexfoliation one eye, even though there is no evidence of pseudoexfoliation in the other eye, when uh, you do a, a conjunctival biopsy in the other eye, it's supposed to show a microscopically presence of pseudoexfoliation. And 50% will become bilateral in 15 years. Whereas in our case, if you look at our prevalence study, and almost 15% in six years have become bilateral. But literature says that 50% of them, it will become bilateral in 15 years. And all of you know the clinical features. You, you have to look for the pupillary rough for the presence of the pseudoexfoliation. Best way to diagnose pseudoexfoliation is always with a dilatation. So make the patient sit under slit lamp and look for it. What do you see? Hmm? Hmm? Targets. Huh? Huh? Targets. How does it look like? Central area. Clear. Hmm. Why clear? Clear area. Yes. So because of the pupillary reaction, it gets rubbed away, and then you see the the peripheral layer where there is no pupillary rub. This is how it will look like. You can see the associated dense nuclear cataract. And as I told you, look for the pseudoexfoliation at the pupillary margin, lens surface. You can also see an angle, anterior chamber, if it's very severe. 
and look at waft dilatation zonules and also ciliary process. As we mentioned, the lens will have three distinct zones. Other than that, whenever in eyes with pseudo exfoliation, when we dilate and look at the slit lamp, interestingly, you will see a lot of pigment that will get released after dilatation. It's not very uncommon. Because of this, post dilatation pressure also can be on higher side. Other than this, because of the loss of this kind of pigment loss, sphincter transillumination defects is common. And whatever pigment that gets released gets deposited in the trabecular meshwork. So you will see it, pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork along with the sampleist line. What is sampleist line? Pigmentation of pelvis line. So where do you see it? Which quadrant? Inferior quadrant. Because of the gravity, it tends to settle down inferiorly. So sampleist line is very characteristic. How do you differentiate? trabecular meshwork pigmentation of pseudo exfoliation from pigmentation in the pigment dispersion. Patchy wear, pseudo exfoliation, good. So in pigment dispersion, the pigmentation will be uniform. Is there any time in pigment dispersion you can have a patchy pigment? Initial, burnt out phase. So it is not an initial. Initial, you will see uniform. When the, when the patient passes that the maximum contact age, that is from 30 to 40, where the contact between the zonules and the iris is maximum, when patient crosses, crosses 40, 45, the contact between the iris and the zonules will get minimized because of the change in the accommodation of the lens. Then the pigment dispersion will not be constant. Then you will see pigment getting washed away from the angle, then you can see the patchy pigmentation. So what happens with the pseudo exfoliation if it keeps deposit, getting deposited? Because it gets deposited on the zonules, the integrity of the zonules will come down. Because of that, there will be displacement of the lens sidus diaphragm forwards, resulting in narrow angles. Later, you can have subluxation or dislocation. And because of this, the increased complications during the cataract surgery. We all know pseudo exfoliation eyes, everybody will be worried. You take all kinds of precautions because the eyes are at a higher risk to develop complications, mainly because of loss of zonular integrity. And even if you succeed in doing the cataract surgery, because of it is a continuous process, because of more and more deposits of the uh, the pseudo exfoliation in the zonules, there will be decentration of intraocular lens, and one day you can have a capsular bag, entire bag being decented. Other than that, capsular contractions are common, so that is mainly because, again, the material may be producing some amount of inflammation that causes the capsular contraction. For similar reason, PCV also is common in this size. What are the ocular association? We did talk about it. There can be significant associated nuclear cataract. That again, they are supposed to be reduced ascorbic acid in the anterior chamber. That is, uh, that alters the metabolic mechanism of the lens and results in the cataract. And eyes with the pseudo exfoliation tend to have something called the ocular ischemia. That may be iris ischemia with the microneovascularization. So it is not uncommon to see small hyphemas post cataract surgery in an eye with the pseudo exfoliation. And because of this, there will be chronic breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier, and, and these eyes are at a higher risk to develop inflammation. Uh, I also, there can be abnormal homocysteine metabolism in people with the pseudo exfoliation because this all comes under the similar metabolic uh, pathogenesis leading to the central retinal vein occlusion. So these eyes are at a higher risk to develop CR vivo. So when you look at pseudo exfoliation and glaucoma, how does it happen? It increased output resistance in the trabecular meshwork is the most common cause. It may be mechanical because of the material blocking the trabecular meshwork uh, openings, or it may cause degenerative changes in the trabecular meshwork, or the pigment dispersion that happens may cause obstruction. There is also possibility increased aqueous protein concentration because of the ischemia. 
that can be raised in the intraocular pressure. We did talk about the deposits of the pseudoexfoliation in the other parts of the body. Because of this, uh, there are many systemic associations seen with the pseudoexfoliation, like TAA, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's. And uh, they're supposed to be reduced ocular retrovalvulence, cerebral blood flow. And these are all the other biochemical changes you see. And as I mentioned, there is increased mortality. And yes, there is no definite trend because the data available worldwide is not conclusive. But we did see in our incident study, the mortality was double in people with the pseudoexfoliation. What are the challenges in terms of management of pseudoexfoliation glaucoma? One is, since it is an age-related disease, you have two types of issues. One is associated with the open angle, and we also see the narrow angle glaucomas. And in the second is instability of the zonular support that makes the situation challenging for the cataract surgery. So does pseudoexfoliation behave differently? Eyes with pseudoexfoliation. Yes, it can behave differently. We did talk about it, how the conversion rates are much higher. So if you look at the uh, ocular hypertension conversion to glaucoma, and uh, it was um, almost a double. If you look at the progress, the, that was in 8.7 years, the conversion was twice. The similar way, we also found only in eyes with ocular hypertension and pseudoexfoliation they converted into glaucoma. And we did say that association with the narrow angles, so what percentage of them will develop narrow angles? Prevalence was 8.3% in our study. We did say that uh, cause for the cataract is ocular ischemia and hy uh, hypoxia. The second cause is again in environmental, the UV rays that people get exposed being the outside uh, workers makes this eye susceptible for the nuclear cataract. We did say that uh, central corneal thickness is thinner. So because of this, the, it becomes a confounder when we measure the pressure. We set the target pressure. We try to achieve the target pressure because thinner corneas will need very low intraocular pressure as the target pressure. If you don't pay attention to that, we may be under-treating our uh, patients with the pseudoexfoliation. So we have to take into account the central corneal thickness. So how do we treat them? We, in general, the concept is that eyes with the pseudoexfoliation glaucoma, uh, uh, pseudoexfoliation glaucoma, they respond poorly to the traditional treatment what we offer to the primary open angle glaucomas. So that is the first dictum. You have to treat this group differently from the eyes with the open angle glaucoma. And the need for the laser surgery is found to be high in the literature. What are the laser procedures we do? One is like open angle glaucoma, laser trabeculoplasty. The second laser procedure often we can, we may do it will be if you see narrow angles without significant cataract being associated. So if you look at the organ laser trabeculoplasty, again, there's good amount of information available, mainly from the countries where the pseudoexfoliation is very common. And all of them were found that there is a good response to the organ laser trabeculoplasty. So with the advent of the SLT, nowadays the trend is to do the selective laser trabeculoplasty. It is a good alternative to organ laser trabeculoplasty. And we can repeat the procedure many times. And the lower success rate in comparison to the primary open angle glaucoma, uh, most of the authors concluded because if you don't treat 360 degrees, your success rate will be lesser. Again, baseline intraocular pressure can influence the final IOP. Uh, eyes with um, more than 21 had more IOP decrease. That is the usual trend you see. The higher the IOP, the higher the fall will be in the intraocular pressure. And one advantage one group found was IOP spikes are less and tolerability is better with SLT in comparison with the ALT. Uh, procedure, how do we do it? It is similar to what open angle glaucoma, it is no way different. Similarly, YAKP for the narrow angles with the pseudoexfoliation will be more or less same as with the primary angle closure. 
What is important is uh, IOP spikes can be significant whenever we do the laser iridotomy. For simple reason, there is some amount of compromise of the trabecular meshwork in these eyes. When there is a, in a, such a situation, whenever you do iridotomy, you have to be very careful, try to use the minimum energy. If you use more energy, there is a risk that compromised trabecular meshwork will not be able to handle the amount of the pigment that gets released with your more energy. So the they spike can be quite significant. So we have to use alpha agonist along with the iridotomy. And also remember, these eyes are prone for more inflammation, so inflammatory response is more. But coming to the treatment for the uh, glaucoma surgeries, there are various surgeries done. There are, as far as the glaucoma is concerned, the surgeries are more or less same as with the open angle glaucoma, like trabeclectomy. People have used even express implant along with the trabeclectomy. There are a group of people, again from the East, I mean, European countries where the disease is more prevalent, people tried innovative techniques like trabecular aspiration. Basically, aspirating the trabecular meshwork from the angle so that the disease, the load of the pseudo exfoliation will come down and the disease progression can be reduced. People also tried abinternotrabeculotomy, viscocanlastomy. And also, people tried tubes, and most of the times, very commonly done procedure is cataract in this size because of the associated cataract. As I mentioned, the trabeculectomy is most commonly done in glaucoma surgery, and it is a standard technique. Outcomes and post-operative medication complications are same as PYG, and it can also be done with the cataract surgery. But what is important is, in general, inflammatory response is more with the pseudo exfoliation. There is a need for enhanced topical steroids. Same way, the post-operative hyphema is significant in eyes with the pseudo exfoliation. Angle-based surgeries, it directly addresses the mechanism for raised IOP. Basically, it clears the accumulated pseudo exfoliation and restores the function of the natural channels. And major advantage with angle-based procedures, the pleb-related complications can be minimized, and the conjunctiva is preserved for the future surgeries. What are the angle-based surgeries? We did talk about it, trabecular aspiration, ab trabeculotomy. Very little data is available, and generally it is, they are not very popular procedures. Same thing applies with the express implants and the tube implants. Information available is very, very limited. So cataract surgery, per se, is quite challenging in eyes with the pseudo exfoliation. And whether you do the combined or single, again, is dictated by what is the extent of the damage and other things. But what is important is eyes with the pseudo exfoliation also at a higher risk to develop corneal endotheliopathy and the um, bad uh, uh, corneal problems in the post-surgery. So one has to carefully evaluate corneal endothelial health standards status whenever we schedule patient for the surgery. And these eyes are at a higher risk for the poor mid midriasis because of the deposits and the uh, pupillary mechanism in per se is defective. We did talk about the zonular instability and lens subluxation. There is increased risk of vitreous loss, increased IOP inflammation, later IOL de decentration and dislocation. These things should be discussed well ahead with the patient before we do the surgery. Preoperative evaluation, um, look for it very carefully. Carnal endothelial status, assist the pupillary dilatation, make a note of it. And density and stability of the cataract, make a note of it so that will become useful uh, tool for you when you're doing the surgery. Usually, shallow or irregular AC suggest di lens displacement. So that gives you a clue. When you do the DBR measurements, you do get the anti-chamber depth measurement also. There is a difference between the two eyes, and that cannot be explained by the your clinical uh, features. That basically tells you there can be anterior displacement. And perioperatively, have good akinesia because we are at a, these eyes are at a high risk to develop complications. Anticipate and keep surgical equipment, high-risk hooks, CTRs, VR backup, et cetera, whenever we handle these patients. So how it's the small people management is like any other condition. Have good viscoelastics, 
use mechanical devices on the table to manage the small people. And uh, extent of the zonular dialysis, if it is localized, yes, it is easy to manage. If it is severe and the entire bag is affected, then our plan of action will be different. So localized problems, how do we manage? Capsule tension ring. How does the capsule tension ring helps us? It is a dual purpose. It gives intraoperative support, long-term IOL stabilization. Usually, the diameter is larger than the capsular bag. Because of that, it expands the capsular equator, it buttresses the weak zonules, and equal distribution of the support, and uh, recenters the bag, and IOL will be stable. And also known to reduce the PCO and the capsular phimosis. Pseudo exfoliation with the zonulopathy requires CTR, but can the CTR prevent the zonular problems in future? There is no evidence to say. There is no need to put any CTR when there is no instability of the zonules. So that can be only used when you can see there is a uh, instability of the zonules on the table or if you have noted it in the preoperative period. Type of the eye wall, place the eye wall in bag always because that is the best location for the condition. And three piece versus single piece. Three piece will act like a CTR. If there are one or two clock hours, zonular dehiscence can be taken care. In case of late displacement, fixing the eye oil will be easy. Three piece lens, you can fix the eye oil using the mechanical suture or whatever mechanism, whatever technique you are using. With the back, we can easily fix it. Whereas it is a single piece, then it becomes difficult to do it. So for that reason, many people opt for the three-piece intraocular lens in cases where pseudo-exfoliation is associated with zonular uh, instability. So this is one of the cases where you can see that uh, three-piece lens where the bag has been shifted and had triple in the past. You can see the uh, blep here. What was done was it was just sutured back in its uh, with a mechanical suture. You can see this is the preoperative picture and postoperative picture. A well centered intraocular lens. This is how at a longer follow up patient I is. So postoperatively, we did talk about increased inflammation. You have to take care of it. IOP spikes should be addressed, and they need aggressive topical steroids and AGMs. Capsular phimosis, if it best way is to prevent it, so have a good rexis. So not to leave with a four or five millimeter rexis, at least 5.5 to 6 millimeter rexis. Use the CTRs, where and when needed. In spite of that, if you see the capsular phimosis, best thing to do is to give radi radial relaxing cuts with the YAG capsulotomy. That can minimize. Otherwise, with the phimosis, the refractive status will keep changing patient may not be very comfortable. And uh, management, extensive discussion with the patient, appropriate clinical evaluation and plan for the surgery is mandatory. So this is uh, what I presented as a part of the pseudo-exfoliation for that duration. Thank you very much.